Well, hello everybody out there, Manchester Hooks at Auburn. This is the Progress Report. Again on Wednesday night, a regular feature of abundant life in the greater Manchester area. <laughs> or as my friend Mike Fowler likes to say, the most dangerous hour on TV, because this is live TV. Without a net. Without a net, no safety organization of any kind, and anything can happen, and sometimes it does. And as always, we are happy to have uh, participation by callers and uh, the number I think everybody, I hope, knows is 6403091. Just as a quick preliminary, I just thought I might mention that in regard to shows, I've recently had a, at least one person comment that you have guests, when you're interested in what your guests have to say, how come the guest names can't appear on the screen? Well, we've checked into that, and apparently there's a technical problem with doing that. So anybody out there that's good with technology and can upgrade this equipment so it will have that capability, Get in touch with us because we'd love to be able to do that. It's not because we don't want our guest's name to appear on the screen. We would love it to happen, but at the moment, we just apparently don't have the technical wherewithal to There's make only so many layers of graphics, and you can see, uh, I think, the phone number's above us, and then our, our, our show name is below us, and that's what would have been used to put the guest name up. But Anyhow, please do feel free to participate. We look forward to that. And we'll I have to keep mentioning our guests' names more frequently so yeah, that folks well, who drop in, they might not have caught the Our, our the guest this week has a memorable name. Once you get her name, I don't think you're going to forget it. Oh, white tease. It's, it's Mindy Mesmer. She's one of the uh, nine announced uh, credible candidates, I would say. I don't know if there's any sort of fringe candidates, but nine people with some credibility are seeking to succeed Carol Shea Porter as our congressman representing Manchester and most of the eastern part of the state of New Hampshire in the next U.S. Congress, and she's got a lot of interesting credentials, and she's going to be talking about that, but I think this week we're going to kick it off with another POTUS report in the Progress Report. We the latest edition that. of the POTUS report on the Progress Report. Well, Bob, it's good to be back. I, I, I take my beginning of the month week off, and uh, I, again, I'm going to say it's it's like trying to drink out of a fire hose. There is so <laughs> much going on. Um, the past couple reports, uh, we've tried to kind of talk about a, a story that uh, was not getting a lot of headlines, but it m had moved into the headlines. Um, and uh, when we last uh, were together talking about that, it looked like maybe um, any sort of crisis as far as um, trying to get rid of uh, Rob Rosenstein uh, might have died down. But it turns out, no, that's not the case. Because of the redactions we talked about two weeks ago, uh, he's still in the hot seat, and there are impeachment um, um, uh, bills being drafted against him. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Today I want to jump right into the thing that's right in the headlines um, and kind of hopefully tie a few things together as quickly as I can. Um, you may have noticed uh, today is the day that attorney Alex Vanderswan, who uh, with Skadden Arps, I mean, this is no slouch law firm. They're, oh, they're no. the best white shoe law firm in the country, um, to, to, to hear some say of it. Um, well, he, um, he went to jail today uh, for oh. his part uh, in the... Um, uh, Mueller investigation. He's remember. You may remember he pleaded guilty to um, um, some misconduct, uh, lower level misconduct, and he's going to jail for a month. Um, and today was his first day. And um, he, he uh, apparently is the son of a Russian oligarch, who is partners with um, a gentleman you may have seen in the news, Vic Victor Vexelberg, who has been in the news lately. And he's in the news because his American company, Columbus Nova apparently donated some $500,000, donated, um, made a payment of some $500,000. I guess it was a donation because they didn't get anything for it. Well, or maybe they, they didn't. They maybe got something for it. That's um, what we want to know. To uh, a, a company called Essential Consulting, which is wholly owned by President Trump's lawyer, uh, Michael Cohen. Now, you may remember Essential Cons Consulting was formed 10 days before the Stormy Davis payment was made. Daniels. Stormy. I'm sorry, Stormy Daniels payment yeah. of $130,000 was made 10 days before to be the vehicle for executing the agreement, the, the, the hush agreement, and making the payment. Um, but apparently, um, Michael Cohen decided, heck, I got, a, I got a shell corporation. It's so hard to set up another shell corporation that he just kept it open and started taking in money mm -hmm. um, from the company I just mentioned, Columbus Nova, which is owned by Vic Victor Vexelberg, a, a, a Trump crony, um, who was, by the way, invited to the inauguration. Mean a Putin crony. Uh, I'm sorry, a, a Putin crony. Well, a Trump one crony, of, too. One of, one of the richest of the uh, Russian oligarchs. He, he made a $150,000 contribution to the Trump campaign, um, which sounds like a lot, especially from a foreign national, but I guess they may be looking into that. Um, also, 
also, though, um, giving money to Michael Cohen's company, Essential Consulting, the same shell corporation that he set up for the Dorm Stormy Daniels payment, um, Novartis, AT&T, KAI, K Korea Aerospace, these are huge companies, and the, the, pay the payments amounted to several million dollars. I think I heard 4.4 million. I, I would not be in a position to doubt that. Um, but from what I understand, what they were being promised, and this is coming from one press release from Novartis, who does not deny the payment, they say that they were promised access to the president. Now, I can recall during the campaign a whole bunch of to-do about pay-to-play on the part of the Clinton Foundation, which was an actual foundation that actually did great things around the world. Um, here we have a shell corporation set up for the purposes of hushing a porn star, which somehow, I cannot believe the laziness just continues to be a vehicle to receive these funds. Uh, Michael Cohen is not a registered lobbyist. He is not a pharmaceuticals expert. Uh, AT&T paid him money. I don't know that he's a telecommunications expert. Korea Aerospace is he And AT&T had big issues that they wanted the federal government to act on in favorably to them. They're doing it. They're right in the middle of a merger right big, now. A big acquisition. So um, anyway, th there's much more coming. This is really hot news. Um, but folks, I just wanted to hope, hopefully tie this together and tie it back to the lock her up. Uh, campaign that was specifically dealing with the allegations of pay to play and it really looks like we may be getting somewhere uh, and and who knew this was coming I, I defy anybody two weeks ago to have said oh not you know <laughs> we have a, a pay to pay situation and, and Mueller hasn't even revealed any uh, part of uh, what he's got on this stuff Vexelberg has been in front of uh, Mueller's commission. Novartis has been in front of Mueller's commission, and AT&T has been in front of Mueller's co co commission. So he knew this a long time ago. Wow. Um, wow. Just to tie it all together, uh, the um, Cohen's attorneys did file uh, a pleading in their case in New York uh, where they said that the only way that Michael Avenatti uh, would know this is if he had somehow illegally come into possession with Michael Cohen's bank records essentially admitting it's all true <laughs> very good stay buddy. tuned yeah, stay tuned <laughs> i just wanted to say one quick thing to supplement your POTUS report and the progress report all of this has kind of drowned out the really perhaps even more important news of Trump's I agree withdrawal from the iran uh, nuclear agreement and all i could say about that and i've seen the republicans saying, well, it was a terrible deal, so we're in favor of this. But you know, Mike, when we went to law school, there was a course in first year called contracts. And if you entered into a contract, you were supposed to keep it, unless there was the other party had done something against the contract. Otherwise, you were liable for many kind of remedies, including damages of some type. for breach of contract. That's a long, you know, that's been a cause of action. Uh, for recovery of damages and other remedies in, in certain cases going back hundreds of years in the common law. We had a contract. The other party did not fail to comply with that contract. And there's no allegation of any non-compliance on the part of no, the Iranians. Not, not, in the speech not a bit. Not even Trump can cite that. And yet he disavows that contract. What does that do to the credibility of the United States in entering into international agreements? I'd like that's to just that's just to me so appalling and so low life and I don't understand how the Republicans like Jennifer Horn and Bob Clegg, who we see all at the time at the State House, can defend this action without acknowledging that we just backed down on a solemnly made international agreement, not just between two sovereign countries, US and Iran, but you know, six countries plus the plus the European Union. I just don't get it. I'd and like to weigh in on that a little bit. I'd, I'd like to very quickly, and I, I know we want to get to our guests, but um, I, I have another comparison. Th this to me is like defaulting on 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 your your your, your home mortgage. You know, yeah. we all have a credit score, and that's not just between the, the you and the bank. That credit score is out there. That's 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 your number that anyone dealing with you looks to to see if you're uh, you know a, a credible um, uh, risk. And uh, I think the United States credit score just went down a lot because we just backed out of an agreement for no reason. And that's yeah. that goes to everybody. Um, so if Trump makes a deal with the North Koreans, and that's my next point, um, the next president can say, "I don't like that deal either," and, and, and we're out of that too. Or flip it, I think Kim Jong Un could very easily say, "I can make any deal I want because I can break any deal I want, just like they do." Yeah, right. 
Just so enough about that stuff. So, the, 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 Trump depresses me. Let's move on to something great. Yeah, we have an outstanding guest with us and an outstanding candidate in a very crowded field, as I mentioned. She is Mindy Mesmer. She's already a representative, but her rep currently she's a representative in the very elite 400 of the New Hampshire House. <laughs> <laughs> where I have the pleasure of also serving. And maybe she's decided she'd like to be a representative that, uh, in an organization that actually pays something of a salary. It's not big money, but it's a lot bigger than we get for being in the New Hampshire House, that's for sure. And Bob, she's I didn't know that you were in it for the money. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but I, I supplement that by offering my votes, you know, that's, that's what I do. Uh, so uh, Mindy is, uh, has made quite a name for herself in the New Hampshire House, and, and this is her first term in the New Hampshire House, I guess. Probably, Mindy, it's your first term in elective office anywhere, is that right? Yes. So, uh, you know, I, w I would, you know, I know you're a Seacoast person. I know you have expertise in uh, science and toxicology and, and uh, some things that are really valuable for a legislative body. I think it would be true for Congress, too. And uh, I am just would like you to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, why you decided to be in the New Hampshire House, what your priorities have been, and then we can talk about why you want to move on to the U.S. Congress. Right. Because that seems even more dysfunctional than the, the New Hampshire House. <laughs> I just wanted to say, do we lose more credit today than we had before? I mean, <laughs> with every day that goes on, it seems like we wake up and the, the credibility has already been Surpri marred. It's surprising how much we had that we've been uh, able to I lose know. so much and still have any at all. Right. Well, thanks for being, I really appreciate being here. Um, I came to the State House because um, as an environmental scientist for about 30 years, 20 years of that, I had my own small business, and well, I came... What was that business? Uh, environmental consulting. Okay. Yeah. Very good. I was a um, geologist with an undergraduate degree from Syracuse University, then went to UNH for a graduate degree. I am um, working on actually walking in commencement at Georgetown next Friday for my master's degree in, public, in a public health uh, degree Oh, you're getting program. another degree on yes, Friday? Yes, yes. Well, congratulations. congratulations. I much. did not know about yeah. that. Yeah. So it really, uh, I did that because I understand the toxins in the environment, and, and then I wanted to look at public health impacts from toxins in the environment. So it was something that was already underway, and right at the time when uh, my community was facing some children with rare cancers that people reported to me in my community, uh, parents were worried about there being an environmental trigger for those cancers, and I realized it was a cancer cluster at the time in 2014 and reported it to the state cancer registry. So you were the one that uh, yes. made the state aware of this. What I think everybody's probably, I hope everybody's seen at least some news about the mm. fact that we do have a very concerning cancer cluster. Right. It's not a lot of cases in terms of absolute numbers, but it's way above what we would expect for this. And these are young right. people, right? Exactly. Children, yes. Yeah. Children. Yes, and so it met the criteria. There's four different criteria that it needs to meet, but the um, important thing to note about that is it's a very con constricted uh, number of uh, uh, sets of criteria. And so what we actually found after the CDC defined it as a cancer cluster that there are more than what is included in the cancer cluster itself. Mm -hmm. There's an, about 19 or 20 other cases that are different time frames, but they still are concerning because they're the same kind of cancer. So I reported that in 2014, and it, over the two-year period following, I um, continued to prod for an answer. And the State Department of Health and Human Services came back to me in 2016. Myself and another mother asked us to come to the library in my town of Rye and told us that, yes, it was a cancer cluster, but they were going to watch and see what happened to see if there were any more cases that occurred. And knowing what I knew about how upset our community was and how upsetting this would be to the people in my community, um, I didn't think that was a good answer. So I asked them if they could investigate it further, and they said, no, we we're going to watch it. Um, so a few days after I left that meeting very upset, I decided to anonymously report it to the newspapers. And um, that set in a course of events that, you know, there was a, a, an outrage in the community because the people who had the children with cancer weren't even told that it was a cancer cluster until they read it in the paper. Really? So, yes. So that became, uh, there were meetings set up. Um, the moms and the, the fathers of the kids who had the cancer cases uh, asked for a can uh, Maggie Hassan at the time, our governor, to set up uh, a task force, which she did. I was asked to be on that task force. 
And then, um, you know, in the course of all that work, I met Dr. Sherman, who was my current rep at the time. He right. asked me to replace him because he was going to run for Senate. And my first reaction to him was, you're crazy <laughs> because I'm not a politician. I was a scientist and a mom of two uh, boys and just, you know, and a business owner and a, a student. So I, I had never envisioned that I would be a representative. But he said, no, we really need scientists making policy in the state. And as the, the more I thought about it, the more people I talked to, I realized that was really true. So I've gone to the State House now to work on some of these important issues across the state. I was already working across the CD1 district, organizing, working on uh, these important legislative issues in other towns where we see some like in Merrimack and Litchfield where we see very other very large right yeah environmental issues going on so I, w I already had that you know sort of network laid out of people that I was helping even though they weren't in my district it was still big issues that I felt that my background would um, lend some help to so that's kind of how I got started I was elected in a Republican district was the highest vote getter probably because of the work I was doing on the task force mm -hmm. and went to the first year in session with four ideas in mind and three of those passed to form three commissions the governor signed them into law and those commissions are doing some really important work right now across the state okay Mindy I want to back up because what you've just told us is fascinating your involvement and your ability to make a difference in such a compressed period of time is, is that it, it's spectacular thank you um, but we want to know more about you as a person when did you come to New Hampshire? Where'd you, where'd you go to well, high school? You know, I, tell us more I, about right. Mindy the person. I, your, your son, our director, is telling us it's time for a break. Oh. Well, I think we will uh, come back after the break <laughs> and we will get into who is Mindy Mesmer Great. as a person. And we Absolutely. always try to start the show off that way because yes. nothing gets done if people don't do That's it. Right. So we start, start right. with a person. Great. Okay. So we will take a break, Brian, and we'll be right back. It'll be a very short break, folks. And again, I think we've got a really interesting candidate here. Yeah, you should call in. a crowded in. field, so... Some of this is of interest to you. Call in and uh, participate. 6403091. Be right back. Hi there, everybody. So we're back with our next segment of the Progress Report for this Wednesday, May 9th, uh, 2018. And if you're just joining us, very pleased to say that our guest tonight is one of our fine candidates for the seat being uh, opened up by the retirement uh, decision not to run of Carol Shea Porter. And uh, our guest tonight is Mindy Mesmer, who is a first term but highly uh, effective uh, member of the New Hampshire House, <coughs> who's a scientist and who has made a real uh, real uh, um, issue and very appropriately of uh, toxic threats in our environment particularly in her area of the state which is the seaco she's from rye and she's got a, a lot of things accomplished but there is a very troubling cancer cluster involving children in that part of the state uh, which was not being well addressed until she geared up to take this on and that's what we've been hearing about so, Mindy, when we, uh, when we left, uh, Mike said he wanted to you, a little bit more about you, and then I want to hear about these commissions, too. Great. Yes, yeah, so I uh, was born in Queens, New York. 
My grandparents were both union leaders in uh, their respective fields. My mother and father were both union people, so I grew up in a union household. I'm a third generation union, me union member myself. My mother was um, retired a few years ago as vice president of SEIU 1199 in New York City. She was a union organizer for nurses' rights, nur nurses' workers' rights. So I grew up in that sort of uh, family situation where you know I was watching her she taught me even I didn't really realize what I was learning when I was growing up but she taught me about how to advocate for people and for rights and things so it kind of comes as second nature to me now and that's actually what's helped me do a lot of this work in the State House um, I came up here I went to Syracuse University as I said before uh, came up here in 1985 so I realized that doesn't qualify me as a New Hampshire citizen per se but uh, nature na native born person but I have been here for quite a while but you are domicile that's so right that's okay <laughs> I can vote here <laughs> you can vote here run for office here too as it turns out yeah and so uh, after leaving UNH I went to Hampton Junior High School uh, taught for about a year year and a half in uh, disadvantaged children math and language arts and then I went into the environmental consulting field for uh, about 30 years ago 20 years uh, into uh, 20 the last 20 years I've owned my own small woman-owned business that I started myself for consulting. Do you realize consulting. that you are trying to enter a body over half of which doesn't even believe in science? <laughs> I do and that's why I'm going <laughs> because I need to tell them about it. <laughs> I, yeah, so It's going to be a steep hill for you to <laughs> climb is. should you get it into is. that, uh, that position is. because uh, there are a lot of people up there um, that don't understand what science is. Um, some even try to talk science and it becomes obvious that right. they ought to go back and f right. maybe talk to you about right. what, what it is. Right. But, uh, yeah, we, there is one scientist right now in Congress, his name is Bill Foster, and he's quoted in the press as saying he's lonely there. <laughs> and I certainly understand why he's lonely. Yeah, he's um, the only one. Yeah. We need more than one scientist. So I scientist. take it you differentiate scientists uh, from physicians yes. because there are several yes. physicians. Yeah. So. yeah, there are physicians, yeah. but scientists not. So as we left, you were talking about this very troubling cancer cluster hitting a number of uh, kids in the seacoast area. And you said that uh, you had, uh, as a first term uh, state rep, uh, arranged for, uh, uh, sought to get approval for four commissions. You said three of them were actually the legislation passed. Have any of those commissions reported out? Are we learning anything? Are we getting any close to un un uh, you know, unraveling? solving this mystery of why there's this incidence of cancer. Right, so th there were four bills, w three of them were intended to form commissions and those three passed. The fourth one was to lower the, make more stringent um, the standards for drinking water for these perfluorinated chemicals that we see having been released across the state of New Hampshire at Pease, at Coakley Landfill, which is one of the things that came up during the task force. Where do they come and from? And at St. Cobain. They're f byproducts of um, coating of, ma of materials, Gore-Tex coating. Process? Manufacturing process? Yeah, they use them to coat Gore-Tex, they use them to make Teflon pans, a variety of materials, some of the wires, that is, uh, you know, electrical wiring is coated with perfluorinated chemicals because they're very, uh, they're very immune to high temperatures, they don't degrade, which is a good thing in manufacturing, but not so great when, when they get in into well the water. environment <laughs> or your water or yeah. your body. They stay there for a long time. Yeah. But the other three, the three bills that were um, signed into law created commissions. One was to look at making sure we protect drinking water in the seacoast, which is a big issue with some big releases at Pease and Coakley Landfill that have closed now two of the biggest producing water wells on the, on the seacoast um, from contamination. The other two commissions, one was to form a commission from the task force so that we can continue the work with regardless of who the governor is, which was important at the time. Uh, so that's a commission that's working on some very important issues. Uh, one of the biggest issues we've taken up is Coakley Landfill uh, Superfund site, which was pretty, you know, a, a pretty nasty dump set on the highest hill in the seacoast area without a liner under it. It was closed with a cap on top. And we have been trying to unravel what has happened over the past history. Back in uh, 1992, I think it was, the EPA said you have to cap it and then put a remediation system in to capture the water that flows away from the site. We're not going to make you put a liner underneath it. It doesn't have a liner underneath it. Um, everybody from anywhere, anywhere basically dumped stuff in that landfill, including the Air Force and the Navy from the shipyard. Uh, W.R. Grace, a pretty well-known chemical company down from Massachusetts, trucked it up there oh and yeah, put stuff a, in there. Oh, yeah, there's a famous book about oh their yeah. problems in Woburn, Mass. <laughs> yeah, so there's a variety of, you know, different types of waste that went into that. Uh, we're working on that very hard right now. We're trying to figure out what happened, come to find out that they, the city of Portsmouth, which is the biggest 
responsible party in that um, didn't spend the money that was given to them from the Department of Defense to actually put that groundwater treatment system in. And even though the Department of Justice told them not to use the money for other things, they did to settle a lawsuit that exposed the city of Portsmouth to 10 to $15 million in, it, in liability, instead of spending it on the groundwater pump and treat system. And there was a lot of lobbying that went on. It's a complicated situation. It's one of the big environmental issues that we're, the task force is looking at. It's very you say complicated. say it's complicated. It seems pretty simple to me. Well, when someone takes money and, yes. and, and puts it to improper purpose after being warned not to do so. Mm -hmm. I don't see a lot of complication right. in that small right. sliver of it. I understand right. that right. broadly speaking, right. it's it's and, and, yes. the, and the remediation system has never been never been installed. never been installed never nope. been put in they place. They just capped it and left it, and now you know with the emergence of these new perfluorinated chemicals, we have over a process that's taken a, a while. Now we know that those chemicals are dumping directly into some of the surface water bodies that flow throughout. So the So we have coast. monitoring wells. So we know there's off-site migration. Yes. Into the groundwater. Yes. Yes, yeah, and mm -hmm. surface water. Mm -hmm. So the surface water is contaminated that flows out to Odiarn Point and down to Hampton uh, as well. So Gee. the biggest problem is is going out to Odiarn Bay, uh, Odiarn Point. But so these are complicated issues. The third commission uh, is actually a really um, innovative model to look at defining, uh, identifying cancer clusters and cl clusters of chronic disease before they become out of control problems. Mm -hmm. It's making the Department of Environmental Services and the Health Department. Uh, combine their data spatially on maps to figure out where these problems may exist before they get out of control. So that is an important commission. All three are working hard. We have meetings that are still ongoing. They're not, they've reported interim reports, but we're still working uh, on the final products. So. Okay. Now, I think, you know, our viewers might be particularly interested for you to talk what you know about the situation with St. Cobain's, because yes. that's, that's in our neighborhood right yep. here in Manchester, yes. just over the border down in, uh, down in Merrimack. Right. And there is contamination in Merrimack and Bedford and even some parts in southern Manchester Absolutely. from that. So do yep. you have yep. any insight or information about that? Or, uh, I do, actually. I've been, I, I've been actually working with people in the Merrimack area on this issue for as long as I've been in the house. Um, that is, you know, we know what uh, that kind of gets to my other bill that didn't pass last year, but it was actually an opportunity for me to talk about it, the issues about this um, in the state house. And mm -hmm. now pretty much everyone knows about these issues in the state house. Um, that was um, a release of perfluorinated chemicals over about a 50 year time period. We know that St. Cobain came here from Bennington, Vermont. Where they were asked where to Where they leave. were asked, well, they weren't really asked to leave, they kind of closed up shop. Um, and came here because they were getting he their feet held to the fire there. And there's a big release there as well. Um, Vermont is, has much more strict groundwater um, and drinking water um, guidelines than we do here in the state of New Hampshire. We just collapsed to the EPA numbers. Why is that? We, I, you know, I don't, we, um, that's what I was trying to work on with that other fourth bill um, to get us to come down to other states. So the EPA issued their advisory at 70 parts per trillion and other states like Vermont and now New Jersey are going much lower. M Vermont went to 20 and other states like New Jersey want and look what a much lower number. Got companies coming here to spill exactly. Their garbage and so into what I water. uncovered in my investigations was that very much that there is, you know, written documentation that St. Cobain came here in part because the state of New Hampshire wasn't going to make them put um, catalytic, you know, treatment systems on their um, air uh, emissions, and also that the, the groundwater treatment, the drinking water standards were higher here. So they could come here and do what they wanted, and they contaminated a very large part of the towns that you, do, you just talked about. Um, and the drinking water is now contaminated private wells and municipal water supplies in that area. So, Can you explain why St. Cobain's isn't responsible for 100% of the cleanup of this or the remediation, bringing people on to put them in it? Well, they water? are. It's a, it's a stepwise process that they're being held responsible for it. Um, but, you know, it's a constant battle, I think, between the regulators and, their, and all the attorneys involved to make sure that, you know, they come, they come to their responsibility. So but it's, there's, it's there's absolutely no question that these toxins, these pollutants, came from the St. Gobain's manufacturing yeah. plant. There's I agree. No other, I agree. No other Absolutely. source. It's, it's credible. Absolutely. Yeah. So It's clear that they emitted them. So So really should be uh, should be some action there. Yes. So Are you, there criminal uh, liability? Is, is there criminal liability for, uh, under our current law for um, CEOs who allow this to happen or who come here specifically to do things like this to us? Well, uh, one of the bills that we put in this year, myself and actually a libertarian 
very uh, conservative Republican, um, Jim McConnell, and I actually work together quite a bit. Um, and that's the kind of thing I like to do, by the way, is work across the aisle quite a bit. And he and I put a bill in that would put, pretty much put a polluter's tax on people like St. Cobain that polluted. It would have been a 50 percent tax on top of what they would pay for remediation. So a pretty stiff tax. Um, that bill was unfortunately killed. but. Um, I think there are penalties available to the state of New Hampshire. They don't often implement them, and they ha I don't believe they've necessarily implemented them in this case either. So, One wonders yeah. why. Well, well I, uh, my, my concern is, you know, I, in my committee, as in the, your committee you're in most of, most of the time, we get, a lot of, we get a lot of the DES people there uh, testifying for and against bills they want and bills they don't want. I mean, this is a little concerning about our DES performance. Would you, would you agree? On, I would agree. On both of these accounts? Right. Yes, and, and you know, one of the things that was concerning was in a different bill that I put in, which was to lower, make more stringent the um, arsenic standard in New Hampshire. That came before your committee, too, as mm -hmm. well. And then it went to another committee. And when it was in the other committee, the Ex Executive Departments and Administration Committee, the state um, representative, the regulator um, from DES, stood up and said, when asked, uh, why haven't you um, made a more strict standard? Um, we know New Jersey has a half of what our New Hampshire standard is, and we have 3,000 cases of bladder cancer per, per million when you're really shoot or for shooting for one per million. Why didn't you do it when New Jersey did it, or at least some point between now and 12 years ago when New Jersey did it? And they said, well, we weren't mandated to do yeah. it. And so Jackie Silly, who's on that committee, said, did I just hear you say that until a scientific legislator came to you and told you we should reduce the standard, you weren't going to do it? And their answer was no. So, you know, I, I am very concerned about Aren't they this. scientists? Yes. Aren't? Yes. So, yes. but are they real scientists, or are they well, scientists that I, need another are, scientist I, I, to I tell them what to do? You know, in some cases, I'm horrified it, it, to is, hear this story. it is very difficult, and Bob knows this, to pass legislation when... The, some you know industry lobbyists are involved. Um, I, I, I spent two terms in the state house. Yes, the lobbyists are the staff yes. for the committees. Yes. I understand that yes. very clearly, and, for and the that's regulation. wrong. That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the way we do it. No and that's and that's a very difficult. You know, that is something that I you know one of the things about my candidacy for you know, my congressional candidacy is is to fight these things. And I do it here in the state of New Hampshire. I post the names of lobbyists. I post the groups that. Uh, oppose my bills. I mean, one of my bills was to ca take the crumb rubber off of playgrounds because we know it's causing these rare lung sarcomas in children that play soccer, you know, the goalies, mm -hmm. uh, in women and, and other people. And um, seven lobbyists were flown in from Texas and California and wherever else, North Carolina, to fight my little bill that was going to prohibit the use of this crumb rubber, which is basically retired, you know, uh, recycled hazardous tire waste that they put on these land, these uh, playgrounds. Right, it's considered, ha you, I, yeah. you can't stack them in your backyard right. because it's right. hazardous waste. Right. But you can crumb them up and you can put them on playgrounds and, and wonder why when the dust particles come off of them, kids get sick and women get sick. And so it's, huh. it's pretty incredible that, you know, you know, seven, seven lobbyists being flown in to sit there and talk about how the lead. Oh my God, the committee must have been bowing down in awe. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And just incredible things that are said. I mean, one of my bills that I actually wasn't my bill, but I helped to fight the pesticide um, application on, on nursery schools and playgrounds of elementary schools. You know, I went out into the antechamber after the floor fight, which we lost on that bill, and I found these green pieces of paper lying around, and it said, if you don't spray pesticides on playgrounds, kids are going to trip on dandelions and crabgrass that get out of control. I, li I have a copy of this thing. That's I a good one. I, I couldn't like believe that. it. I mean, first of all, pesticides are not That's for... That's poison for the children. We need, yeah. we need more poison well, for the children. Well, pesticides are for, <laughs> for bugs. They're not, it's not for yeah. herbicides or for... So is this a crazy <laughs> statement? And this is the kind of stuff that happens, you know, that affects how we can get policy passed, so... It's, yeah, it's, it's always well, been, you it's get what you pay for. It's no offense, guys, it's, but it's always interesting <laughs> to me. Industry, very often, whether it's in pharma or you know these these companies, the kind that uh, Mindy's talking about, they will vigorously protest any tightening of the regulations. The smallest, balance. and then when they get in trouble, they want to cite, "We complied with the regulations." Yes, yes. We, yeah. we, you know that we hear that again, but yeah. we complied with all federal and state regulations. But it is it is still true that in in this area. States do have the power to set more yes. strict standards. Absolutely. Of the feds. 
the only place where that isn't true is in nuclear, which is my favorite, of course. But right, uh, right. In, in the air and water pollution, the states don't have to be limited to the federal standards, well, which in California many areas doing are with that when, uh, not at all adequate, and the states lead the way. And, you know, it sounds like in this case, even New Jersey's a leader in some Absolutely. Of Absolutely. And yeah. uh, California is in many areas, of course. So, so, so uh, the people that are drinking the water in Greenland, if their house was in Newark, New Jersey, they wouldn't be able to drink the water, yeah. which is insane to think about. And Coakley Landfill would be, you know, being cleaned up right now be if it was in Newark, New Jersey. So, <laughs> so there you are, folks. As you can see, we have a very knowledgeable guest with an area of expertise that benefits our legislature greatly. I have to think it could benefit Congress greatly, but can that actually happen? We we'll, uh, we want to talk about why Mindy is is seeking to go to Congress and not come back and continue work in the New Hampshire legislature and talk about our campaign a little bit. And we want to talk about some other issues that may be of interest to Manchester, too. So once again, anybody who wants to join us, we're, we always welcome. 640-3091. We'll take our break now, and we'll be back very soon with our final segment for this uh, Wednesday, May 9th, 2018. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody, to this May 9th edition of the Progress Report. Very pleased to have us with an outstanding candidate uh, for the first congressional CD, uh, Mindy Mesmer, a serving representative in Concord at this time. And I guess we have a caller, yep, do we? Yes, we do. We got, uh, I'm told we have Peter on the line. Peter, you're live on the Progress Report. No, looks like we lost him. Okay, Peter, you want to call back? We'll put you on. Uh, we just have to take our break when our director tells us to. So, Mike. You had some other issues. Well, you no, talk I, 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 I'm, we I'm talk fascinated. I'm fascinated by um, the, the the depth and breadth of the knowledge that you're bringing to the table and the effectiveness in 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 getting arcane. And you, you, this is some serious stuff, but it's not the kind of stuff that's going to grab headlines. And and, right. and but you've managed to maneuver through the process and get three out of four um, passed and at least bring the fourth one to the attention of the legislature, which is fantastic. And as I said, um, you know, during our break, I kind of think I'd like you to stay there and, and mm -hmm. keep up this great work, but there's bigger and better things, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, but we're here. It's a campaign. Uh, I think campaigns need a little hoopla, and so I wanted to kind of stir things up a little bit. So if, if you wouldn't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the hot seat, something okay. we've never done before. Mm -hmm. I want to do kind of a quick lightning round. I'm going to say right up front, these are progressive issues um, that are a little bit important to me, and yep. I just want to, if you can just hit your position Absolutely. on these, yep. I'd love it. And the first one would be, um, and, and I'm trying, these are national. These are things that you yep. might be able to Absolutely. do in Congress. Single-payer health care. It was on the table for a minute during the Obamacare uh, um, yep. uh, situation. Uh, we may never get to a point where we can talk about it again, but where do you stand if it Medicare ever Medicare for all. I think it's a program that works. We need to expand it so everyone can access it. It would solve a lot of problems. Uh, people need to be able to get high-quality, cost-effective health care in the United States. We spend so much money on health care, but we have a middleman involved that makes a lot of money off of our health care system. And I think we don't we get, get the get best outcomes And we country. don't get the best people outcomes. People think we have the best health care system. Absolutely. Well, if you're an Arab sheik that can come here and get the top right. flight medical care, <laughs> right. you probably right. do. 
But right. you know, for right. most Americans, it's Absolutely. not the best health care in the world by any Absolutely. means. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next one, another one that our viewers will know is near and dear to my heart. Where do you stand on gun safety le uh, legislation vis-a-vis uh, -vis Second Amendment okay. and your interpretation I take it that. from a scientist's perspective. I know there are a bunch of common sense things we can do to, to stem some of this gun violence that we've seen in the recent weeks. I'm happy to see all the young people stand up and be so articulate and so impassioned about this issue. We need to keep that going. Um, but I think beyond the common sense things, like talking about not the need, you know, we don't need assault rifles on the streets, those kinds of things are just common sense. But when you get beyond, beyond that, the CDC hasn't been able to study this issue. It's a public health issue. Since 1996, they've not been given, they've been prohibited a law. and not given money to do this. You know, I know the last omnibus bill that came out last, last week, I think it was, allowed them to study it possibly, but it was unfunded. So I'm not clear that they're actually being given the opportunity to do that. I know that here in New Hampshire, the second leading cause of death in our 10 to 34 year old children and people um, is suicide. We know that 51% of those deaths just about are committed with guns. So I think it makes sense to have a waiting period, a cooling off period. If you want to get a gun, just come back in a couple of days and then we can maybe stem off some of that suicide um, with guns. But, you know, I think there are some real needs to study it in terms of public health. Suicide really is a, a kind of a hidden component yes. of this uh, gun debate. Um, mm -hmm. It's a big component, it is. but it's not discussed. It is I'm a big component. happy to hear you bring that up. Um, next, uh, no, only five. Um, okay. Next one, um, federal uh, reclassification of marijuana. I am, you know, we are an island now in amongst all the New England states where it is now um, federal reclass, you mean, oh, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, so I think- The states can do what they want, but right, right now we have right. the shadow of the attorney general right. saying he's gonna, right. you know, he's still gonna Yeah, I think it's time. Laws. I mean, you know, I, I at Georgetown, we do a lot of, I, I hear a lot of talks about how they study various things. They can study um, cocaine and heroin in their labs, but they can't study marijuana. And marijuana does have a lot of effects that are, you know, it's a, it's a complex plant. It probably has a lot of, plant, of effects that synthetic materials don't mimic. So I think it is actually something that we should be studying. We know it has some real good benefits for some epilepsies and things like that. Um, and I think that we, sh we definitely should reclassify it and allow it to be studied. You may have noticed I'm moving more and more progressive as I get through these questions. Um, the next one, regulation of social media like Facebook. Is it time for Congress to step in and start regulating these, uh, hmm. these for-profit organizations that have all of our secrets? I think, you know, there is definitely some work to be done in that area. I'm not a huge fan of overregulation, but I definitely think they need to be held accountable if they're taking our data and using it for other and giving it out for uh, various things. So I, I, I think, you know, there's probably some work to be done there. Last but not least, a guaranteed minimum salary for all Americans. This is actually something I've been looking at. Um, you know, I have been studying some economic issues lately, have a couple of economic advisors. It's actually something I've been looking at. Um, you know, I think that when we talk about minimum wage, I think it definitely needs to be way, uh, raised. I think, you know, the Democratic, Democratic Party talks about $15 an hour. I think in some cases that's probably not going to be enough. It should be raised to $20 in some places. So I, I think we definitely need to do something for our working families, especially where there are many corporations that don't want to pay health insurance. They use it um, to, um, you know, we basically are all paying their health insurance when companies like Walmart can, um, you know, not pay uh, for health insurance and, and pay substandard minimum wages. So I think we need to raise the minimum, minimum wage and, and look at some other programs to, to make, to help our families who are working two and three jobs to make a family, you know, make ends meet and still are $400 away from bankruptcy with a serious illness. So. Four hundred dollars away. It's, uh, so you have looked into this because that's yes. the figure that I've heard. Yeah. You know, that's the uh, uh, what sixty percent of Americans couldn't take yep. that kind of a hit. Absolutely, what, uh, hey, without some just serious apology. disruption and you know, to their. One programs. of the things I've done as a candidate is I've gone to I think about sixty of the communities in the CD one district already, and one of the astounding things is that there are, there are many people who are really hurting in our state that don't, you know, they don't get enough coverage. We don't, we don't talk about it enough, but there really are a lot of people hurting. And that bothers me a lot, that, that we have families that are really trying hard to make ends meet, and uh, they're struggling, so. Okay, well, I, I appreciate your taking the time to go through this. We've never tried this before, but it was, it's I think great. it was enlightening. And, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, certainly we're, we're ready for I, it. I think this is probably going to be kind of a softball for you, Mindy, but we are in Manchester, the largest city in northern New England, the largest city in the state. And uh, we have exciting prospects here with the, uh, you know, Dean Kamen's Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, or Army, which has just, uh, just got me really enthralled with the uh -huh. potential uh -huh. here. It's just so enormous. 
but uh, a lot of us think that uh, you know we're we're kind of backward and we may not be doing all we can to have that project succeed if we don't get some passenger rail up here oh yeah I mean, Absolutely. You can, you, where you live, you can go to Exeter and get on a train and go to Boston or go to... Theoretically, you know, but they know. don't have enough, you know, it's, it's so popular that it's hard to get on those trains. Is it really? Oh, yeah. I've had, I've had a hard time getting on, so that tells you something right there. It does. I did not yep. know that There's was the There's a fact. market for yep. this. There is a market. Okay. You know, and sometimes my son, who's in, going to school in Boston, he'll have to go up to uh, Newburyport, and I have to go pick him up in Newburyport to get a train out of, out of wow. Boston to come no, home. Oh, you've told me something I absolutely didn't yes. know. That's very exciting. Yes. Okay. Are there, are, there any, are there any other issues that you might want to talk about that uh, you think would be particularly of concern to the state's largest urban center here? And how about the opioid crisis? Oh, yes. Uh, so, I, you know, I've spent one of the things uh, um, I've done in the state legislature is really work on expanding um, the access to, um, uh, opioid, uh, to medical marijuana for um, treatment for uh, chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the things I did was set up some meetings with our committee and the criminal justice committee at the alternative treatment centers to actually talk about what's going on in those centers and talk to the people who are being treated Am with I medical cannabis. Am I correct in, in my, <coughs> I, I believe my un is an understanding that there is some evidence, some scientific evidence linking medical marijuana with alleviation in some cases of... Uh, There's not a ton of scientific evidence right now. There's anecdotal information. And actually, my capstone project at Georgetown is going to be looking at two treatment centers, hopefully in New Hampshire, and whether or not it actually there is evidence to prove that it's helping. Um, my anecdotal information, you know, having talked to people in those centers, has told me and other doctors that it does alleviate the use of opioids and it actually takes them off entirely in most cases. So it's very promising. Um, you know, I know that. We are on a very steep, I haven't seen the most recent numbers, but I saw them, I think it was a week or two ago. Uh, the opioid overdose deaths here in New Hampshire is still steadily increasing. It's not getting any better. I can't understand it, but apparently that's the case. Yeah, and it's, and it's all, it's not so much, you know, any more doctors prescribing it out of control. It mm -hmm. is the, um, it's the illegal trade. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. And so it is a, a complicated issue. We, you know, probably have to look at distributors to see if they're being responsible about distributing. We have to look at the um, copycat manufacturing that comes in from China through Canada. Yep. We have to look at that. Um, and we have to fund our, you know, fund our um, community health centers. They're the frontline people along with the Manchester safe stations here in, in the... In the uh, uh, we see here in Manchester oh, yeah. where they're struggling yes. mightily I have, uh, I have to keep up with the demand. Yep, I've spent yeah. quite a bit of time talking to the Manchester Fire Department safe station people, um, what they're seeing, what's happening. You know, I think we go about treating it Basically, the 28-day treatment centers right now are based just detox, really. Yeah. We really need to look at better ways of continuing that extended treatment. Well, we have treatment. models. Uh, I, I personally know of numerous instances, uh, situations, it seems always in Florida, always more than 28 days. Um, but in the case of my anecdotal experience, 100% uh, effective. Yeah. 100%. Um, Good. Not, Good. You know, so why aren't we doing that? Right. Yeah. yeah, I think we need to. Why do we got to go to Florida to, to get that? Why right. can't we get it here? Right. So why Congress? Why what, Congress? What's wrong well, with the Great New Hampshire? You know, House? people do ask me, and I have heard quite a bit what you have said about me staying here in New Hampshire. And you know, as a scientist who's working on these issues, I do have a background that um, would help me work on some of the things that I think I'm preempted from working on here in the state of New Hampshire. Um, and I've talked to you know people that are very high up in the Department of Defense. We know that. Um, climate change and drinking water mm -hmm. issues are the two top threats to our national security right now. We only have one scientist in Congress. I think we need somebody who, with the background that I have to go and work on these issues that are such a threat to our national security down in Congress. How are you going to deal with your counterparts who simply will say, well, the debate's still on. Um, uh, there, I know, I, I read a report signed by a scientist that said that there's no global no climate change happening at all you know yes. but that's a scientist <laughs> right um well how well. do you address <laughs> yeah that's debatable at least they wear a white coat when they're on tv yeah. right well it, you I, know, my tongue is planted firmly in my cheek when i ask this question right, but um, right, nevertheless right. you're going to have to deal right. with that and yeah. they're not going to want to listen to you you know what i you know i have done that in the state house too i say that maybe 30 percent of the republican party are not people that are going to listen to my my talk or you know decide that they agree with me but there is a wedge of republicans that are revolting i think against this extreme right position 
that the Republican Party is taking. And that wedge of people I have been able to work with. I have worked with a lot of Republicans on You can on arm them with the knowledge they need yeah, to take Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Steve Marchand talks about, you know, when he started campaigning as for governor, he talks about, you know, water protection issues were not even on the radar of people. Now, when he goes and talks in towns, it's always one of the top two. And he credits me largely with having brought that to the surface of the state and to so the recognition like he has of has good people. reason to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, and those are the things, you know, those are th the things that I'm preempted from working on. Some of the things like how do we prove chemicals for use here in the United States? Europe mm -hmm. makes you prove that they're safe before they can go on the market. Here we kind of throw them out in the market and see what happens. Yeah. And I, it, those things are not something we can do So here. we're already getting very close to the end. It's Sorry. unbelievably how fast <laughs> this goes. I know. It goes we're, very we're, fast. It goes very fast. It's very enjoyable. Amazing. I love it. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so we want to get you the chance to talk a little bit about your campaign. How are you going to emerge out of this field of nine to uh, to get more people to vote for you than the others and uh, you know what people can do to help do you right. have a website do you Absolutely. have an office yep. open Where so my website is www.mindy4forcongress.com we are on facebook and twitter we're very active on social media mindy at, at mindy the number four congress are both the facebook and twitter feeds um, we put out a lot of information if you go to our website and sign up for um, get connected it's called you can um, get connected to the campaign and we send out emails i send out weekly legislative summaries now during the legislative season as well as campaign emails about federal national issues um, so we're very connected to, on social media um, i have made it a, a, a goal to get out to every city in town in the 90 90 or so towns of the CD1 district. I've already been to at least 60. I'd have to recount now to see. But I, I think that that is really important for me. I am a, a grassroots activist. I definitely want to touch base with people. I want to talk to them. I am going to get to every single town and talk to people. That And I've been working across the district since before this ever happened. So on these issues that and are I important. And I assume that at some point you will be having an office here in Manchester. Yes, we will. Okay. Yep, well, we will. We look forward to that. Well, this has been great, Mindy. It, uh, it really did go by fast. And you, Absolutely. You obviously have an awful lot to offer any any organization you choose to be a part of. And it's these uh, these uh, government organizations, these legislatures is, is great. And so uh, we, we wish you well. put the science back in policy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my daughter wanted to do this. Both of my kids are scientists. And great. She, she, she one time wanted to be a scientist in helping public policy. But she's a now I'll a call teacher her up. instead yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was her ambition so you're kind of following what her ambition was in a way so that's that's great we thank you very much for coming over thank i know you you're going to be back here anybody who wants to see mindy again yes. she will be at the city devs meeting at the city library this saturday at 10 a.m along with another candidate i guess is also going to be a speaker at that meeting but if you liked what you've seen from mindy and you want to come down and hear more there will be an opportunity in just uh just uh, three days yes We'd love Saturday to meet you. morning, Saturday morning, right yep. here in the great city of Manchester. So thank you, uh, Brian, and thank you for coming in, uh, Mindy, and uh, we wish you the best. Thank you so much. And we'll be back with another nice issue of the Progress Report next week. <laughs> sure will. See you next week, folks. <laughs>